Why didn't that work? Goofy, I have a button on my stream deck here. I don't, yeah, you can see my stream deck. I have a button on my stream deck that's supposed to do a whole bunch of things like stop the music and then switch over cameras and all this. And frickin' did not work today for some reason. Good morning, party people. Hello, Surly Dev. Good to see you over there in chat. Uh, Still Garf, good to see you as well. I'm uh, avoiding work this morning. Probably not unusual, but I am avoiding work. Um, I woke up around 2, 3 in the morning, and I uh, spent the morning planning a pizza party. Um, the backyard's finally finished, and Eve is over in China for a month seeing her family. I uh, finally got her green card, permanent resident card here for the U.S., so she could go back to China for the first time uh, since the pandemic started. Hadn't seen her family in like four years. Uh, so I'm, it's like Bachelor Pad Central over here at the Ozar house. So we're doing a pizza party. I was ordering all the supplies for that. And then uh, realized that we have a gas fire pit back there. And I'm like, oh, s'mores. I totally need those s'more sticks and uh, supplies for s'mores. And, you know, one thing led to another. So there's probably only going to be like 15 people max. Uh, just a bunch of friends of mine from local like Vegas restaurants and retail type stuff. Um, uh, didn't want to invite too many people. We've done a bigger party here at the house. We had a 50th birthday party for me and an F1 uh, watch f1 race watch party and we had i don't guess maybe 30 people for those um but uh when you get that many people involved it you, i kind of want someone else here with me uh eve does most of the party management type stuff vlast welcome to the chat uh first time chatting there this button set isn't working at all let's kill this and restart it just to see if that helps and there it goes oh i'm even going to unplug this uh do to do to do to do see if unplugging and replugging of course the classic thing with the stream deck because without the stream deck i don't even get sounds when i go to push buttons yeah it's early depth says uh turn it off and on again stream deck there we go let's refire the app and see if that helps it at all let's try yes yes it worked uh, DBA Doc, good morning. Uh, Surly Dev says, did you sit all your cars in your lounge watching the F1? We were partying, so we had so many people here that we had probably 15 people in, probably 20 people in the main, like, dining room, living room area, where we had, uh, like, two TVs set up in different parts of the room. And then we had some people out st outside by the pool. We have a big TV by the pool. And then people up in the home theater as well, which was uh, pretty wild. Morse, good to see you as well. So now that we got our technology straightened out, let's go hit a couple of questions. There are actually some really interesting questions in today. So the top voted question is from DBA in VA, who says, I recently discovered the force order query hint. I'm usually inclined to let the optimizer do its thing, but I've seen some of our code perform much better with this hint. Are there gotchas or downsides I should know about? Yes. As your data distribution changes, your query plan will not. As SQL Server gets new cool options in query processing, you probably won't take advantage of a lot of those either as well. So by using force order, what you're really doing is tying SQL Server's hands behind its back. Now, why that? while that may turn you on personally, it's probably not the best option for your business long term. What I would say is, if you just discovered that, you probably haven't been to my Mastering Query Tuning class yet, and it's probably time for you to go start making a journey like that, rather than going down the bondage route. Good morning, link to the Jake and CTI geek there. Next up, we have Rojo. I assume it's Rojo, like Spanish for red. It says, we call SQL from C-sharp code, but it's hard to trace in SQL where that code is, co or the, where the query is coming from. Is adding a comment at the end of the SQL statement a viable solution, or are there better ways to do it? If you have the flexibility in the code to edit every query, you can do that. <laughs> what I personally prefer is putting it at the beginning rather than the end, because with long queries, it can actually get trimmed out when you're looking at the plan cache. In a really perfect world, you put it right after the select 
because the select and everything after that is included in the plan cache really easy to see with monitoring tools stuff like that if you go before the query starts you actually have to open up the execution plan uh, in most cases to go see where the comments coming from um, the problem that I have with with in most shops when I when I float ideas like that is that it's just too hard to add that to all of the code if you're using a homegrown ORM or something like dapper then it's easier but uh, as long as you're talking about traditional ORMs um, or even just rolling the T SQL yourself if you were building it yourself there's so much work involved in touching every piece of code after the fact that it's just a no uh, no go for shops What's much easier is to use a tracking utility or tr a mo application based monitoring tool, something like a new relic that instruments everything inside the code. So that way it tracks which queries are taking the longest and then shows you on whichever web page or part of the client application is doing it. That's easier usually to implement. <laughs> and Laka says, uh, here's my favorite life coach, man, that sentence, what problem are you trying to solve? I will say that a lot during this office hours, I'm sure. Next up, we have Oracle is better. <laughs> says, uh, hi, I have a large database of over 90 terabytes. My full backup is taking two days. Stop, time out. The answer is sans snapshots. Go to your storage uh, admin, whoever's managing your storage. Even if you're up in the cloud, there's going to be someone like a Windows engineer who manages your storage. And ask about sans snapshot basics. They are a lifesaver. Most of my clients who move even over one terabyte databases switch over to storage level snapshot backups back stuff up within a matter of seconds not minutes or days it's a total lifesaver next up Raj says when would you want to manually create statistics without a corresponding index never 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 Raj you're asking that because you're like why would anyone ever do this you're right you wouldn't because the cool thing, one of the many cool things about SQL Server is that it'll automatically create statistics on any column anytime it needs them. Now, there are rare edge cases like filtered statistics. Filtered statistics are stats with a where clause. Because stats only give you 201 buckets in SQL Server, those filtered stats help you hone in on certain parts of the table that you may care much more about. But just creating statistics themselves without that where clause, never. Next up, Kimberly says, I've got a two node availability group on 2019. SQL Server shows two databases in the AG when they're not. Why does SQL Server think the database is in the AG when it's not? In terms of why I couldn't tell you what I would start with for troubleshooting, because what your real question is, is how do I fix this, not why? Now, the first thing that I do is I would restart each of the nodes, just restart them, not even just the SQL Server service, I'd restart the whole box, because if things have gone that sideways, you probably have other issues as well. I'd make sure I'm on the most recent patches, and then if neither of those have fixed it, I would open a call to Microsoft. One of those where you're seeing something that's a one-off weirdo fluke, who knows what caused it, but that $500 call to Microsoft will be a much better uh, bang for the buck there. Ha! Next up, Mike says, Brent, can you tell in which ways SQL Server is better than Postgres and vice versa? So this is a huge monster question that could go on for hours and hours and people would debate endlessly in forums. I'm going to kind of uh, shortcut it a little bit and say that SQL Server is really expensive. Postgres is free. People say, oh, but you need a support contract. Yes, you do a SQL Server also. Lest you forget, there's software assurance with SQL Server, and that ain't cheap either. Oh, but just total cost of ownership. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, keep going, calculate all that out. And SQL Server is really expensive, and Postgres is not. So I actually advise clients, when you're building a brand new application from scratch, in the year 2024, you shouldn't be building new applications in SQL Server unless there is a specific feature that you need 
that Postgres doesn't have. And that's where we start doing a design review and say, what are the exact features that you really need? Now, I, I should say, I, I kind of cheated a little bit there. If SQL Server is the only database that your team has experience with, there's also an advantage to that, too. Your team can hit the ground running uh, and move much more quickly, ship applications more quickly. Uh, but if you're just starting from scratch and you don't have much of a team, you should think really long and hard about that. Uh, are there features that SQL Server has that Postgres does not? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the, the, one of the things that I would pop in is easy high availability and disaster recovery and easy encryption. Um, SQL Server has all kinds of really cool options for encryption, row level security. Uh, so if you needed to do enterprise level compliance, you're probably going to have an easier time checking those boxes with SQL Server. And same thing with high availability disaster recovery. But then when you turn around and you look at host Postgres, like on Amazon Aurora, where you don't have to manage the high availability or disaster recovery, and it kind of starts negating some of those challenges. Next up, we have, oh, Janice, thanks for the uh, follow. Uh, next up, Rollback asks, writing articles about SQL Server does not earn much money. What do you think is the main advantage of writing articles? That's a great question. Search for Brent Ozar, How to Start a Blog. And I've got this big, long, detailed post. One of the things that I tell you about is why you should blog. And honestly, it's your resume. People with a blog have a written track record over time showing they were doing what they say they were doing. And a person with a blog, just like a person with a GitHub history, has a clear set of evidence showing what they were doing at the time. The blog isn't going to be the thing most likely that gets you hired immediately. They're not just going to go, well, they've got a blog. Worse, our search is done, just like they wouldn't say that about a GitHub history. But it's another piece of evidence as part of your hiring process. I'm not saying everyone needs to write one. If you don't like writing, it's not for you. But if you do enjoy writing, it's a cool way to augment your resume. Uh, let's see here. There were, uh, in the meantime, a couple of things came in. Uh, Janice says, my first live session on a day when I just watched the last three office hours on demand. That's funny. Um, I, I got kind of, I didn't do office hours for like a week and a half. I haven't done any live ones uh, for a little while. And it wasn't it wasn't because I was working hard. Honestly, I've been playing a lot of Dead by Daylight. That's not entirely true. I've been playing Dead by Daylight, uh, but I also re-recorded about half of Mastering Index Tuning, the Mastering Index Tuning class. Uh, I re-recorded about half of that to update it for SQL Server 2022. So if you're one of my uh, recorded class Season Pass subscribers, you can go see what's new over there. Um, then uh, I uh, played a lot of, after that, I also played a lot of Dead by Daylight. Because uh, they have this winter event that's starting soon, and so that, those, those are always a lot of fun. I've also been playing Michael Myers. Um, Michael Myers is a uh, killer in Dead by Daylight. They call him the shape, um, but uh, he does is really good at jump scares. I love jump scaring the bejesus out of people. I don't necessarily want to kill them as a killer. I just have fun jump scaring the bejesus out of people. To me, that is hilarious because you can see when you when you like stalk them and you go into third uh, evil within three, all of a sudden people hear the noise and they know that you're somewhere around and they freak out and they don't know what to do. Uh, they don't know where you're coming from. And then you materialize around a corner and bah, people just completely freak out. It's so much fun. Um, uh, Orion says for high availability for Postgres, rep manager plus PG pool for connection pooling. Connection pooling is also something that people kind of take for granted with SQL Server that you don't have to, or take for granted with SQL Server, something you don't have to worry about, but it's a consideration uh, for Postgres. Not saying it's a downside, it's just something that surprises uh, people. Then there was another one. Uh, yeah, no, perfect. That's good. Okay, let's see here. Next up, we have 
Oh, uh, Lysander says in boxed SQL, when should you use table partitioning versus partitioned views? The answer to that one is really in my mastering index tuning class. In my mastering index tuning class, we have a module uh, where I talk about partition views and how to implement them and all the ways that they're better than regular table partitioning. On the other side, if you're using column store indexes, column store, especially column store clustered indexes, are a really good fit for table partitioning. So that, there's a short answer version of it. The long answer version of it is in my mastering classes. Oh, next up, Mike says, in which scenarios are failover clustered instances preferable over availability groups? Great question. You have a giant database. I'm going to say 50 terabytes, 100 terabytes. You have a giant database and you want automatic failover with no human intervention within 60 seconds with no data loss and you don't want to pay for another copy of the database because 50 to 100 terabytes, that's serious data space. You don't want to pay for another copy of the database and you don't want to pay for the overhead of inserts, updates, deletes going across the wire to another availability group member. Failover clustering beautifully shines there. Another place that failover clustering shines beautifully is when you have hundreds or thousands, I say that kind of jokingly, but usually it's more like hundreds of databases on the same SQL server. The overhead of availability groups is a giant pain in the ass when you start to get to hundreds of databases, especially multiplied across several replicas, whereas failover clustered instances don't have that overhead. So there you go. And it's still true for all future versions of SQL Server that are out there right now. I say all future, all current versions of SQL Server that are out there right now. Next up, another data layer says linked server versus polybase. Uh, nope, stop right there. It's kind of like saying running with scissors versus running with knives. Which one should? Neither. You shouldn't be doing either of those. Put the scissors and the knives away. If there's a place that you need to get data from, go connect to it and get the data there. That will be faster than trying to phone a friend and have them get the data for you. It doesn't matter which friend you phone. It doesn't matter how many of them. You're going to get faster response time if you just connect to the thing that has the data that you want. Period. End of story. Will you hear Microsoft trying to sell you these features? Absolutely. Because they involve more licensing costs because it's more CPU work on those SQL servers. Microsoft makes more money when you spend more. I don't make any more money regardless of what your SQL server licensing is. And in fact, it's in my best interest to tell you to save as much money on your licensing as possible so that you can use it on things like my training classes. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Don't Bother Asking, who says, My friend has inherited a database which has lots of non-clustered primary keys and few uh, clustered indexes. Delete, update, insert, query performance is not great. Will adding clustered indexes improve query performance? And if so, are there any gotchas? All you have to do is test, right? All you have to do is test. Take two copies of the same table, doesn't need to be in production, can be in your development environment. Take two copies of the same table, one with a clustered primary key, one with a non-clustered primary key, all the other indexes exactly the same. Do inserts, do updates, do deletes that match your workload. For each of the queries, look at their execution plans and compare their set statistics I.O. back and forth. And then you'll see, given your exact table structures, which ones make more sense. I say that just because it's a really easy experiment for you to run. 
if you can't run that experiment, then you shouldn't be asking the question. I think you can run the experiment, though, based on your complexity of your question. I think you can run that experiment. So I want to get you to go ahead and uh, tie your own shoes instead of coming to me every time you want them tied. Bonnie says, uh, do you have a good way to determine which operators in a query plan are contributing the most to a memory grant? So I have a really crappy answer. I just glance at the plan and I look at the size of the data moving through each operator. And I go, okay, there's a million rows coming through here. There's 50 million rows coming through here. Then I look at specifically at the operators that involve sorts. Uh, really, it's always sorts. I don't know why I look at anything else. It's always sorts. Uh, adapt, adaptive indexes or adaptive joins are never that high. Sorts are really, oh, and spools. Uh, so there's um, eager spool index spool, which will also do it. Uh, but generally speaking, that's, uh, that's the place that I go. Um, but no, I, I don't, uh, I wish that there was like a color coded way to show which ones had the biggest memory grants. But the other thing is, I, what I would also come back to, as we were talking about earlier, what's the problem you're trying to solve? If the problem you're trying to solve is high memory grants, I wouldn't look at the operator level. I'd step back and say, how are we sorting data here? How are we grouping data together? And then try to minimize those. Like, look at where most of the, go to my mastering query tuning classes. That's really, I'm going to try, I start explaining them. I'm like, then the next thing that I would do is, well, that's why I wrote a whole entire training class on that. Next up we have, oh, Perseus asks, is there a good way to know why SQL Server ignores a given query hint? I'd be curious what query hint you're giving it that it's ignoring. I don't think I've ever seen SQL Server ignore a query hint. So my guess is that either you've got some kind of syntax problem where you don't explain, you don't understand the hint you're trying to give. For example, if you say max dop zero, that doesn't tell SQL Server to go parallelize the query. It just says if you do go parallel, here's how many cores you can use. I'm guessing it's an example of a hint like that, where it's the hints irrelevant to the query plan or there's something where you didn't understand the hint that you were trying to give it. If you want to follow up with more details, send me the query plan and the query so I can see what query hint it is you're trying to, to deal with there. Next up we have Ophelia who says, what are the top signs that the SQL Server buffer pool is under pressure? Rather than looking at parts of SQL Server and going, is this okay? Is this okay? What about, is this okay? What I would do is go to wait stats. Wait stats tell you what SQL Server is waiting on. One of the wait stats that will tell you that you have possibly a problem with not enough memory is page IO latch. Page IO latch means that SQL Server's waiting to read uncached data from disk, meaning maybe you need to do index tuning, maybe you need more memory. Another one you'll find is resource semaphore, which means that queries are waiting on memory before they can even start. All right, non-subscribers are about to see an ad break. Those of you who are subscribed will see me go hit the next question. The next question comes from Christosimus. Sounds kind of like Hippotamus. Christosimus says, does one database per customer model work well with availability groups? No, unfortunately, because each database needs a certain number of worker threads in order to copy data across to other places. It doesn't work very well with that, which is also why that kind of data database design doesn't work well with managed instances doesn't work cost effectively. It's not that you can't use it. It just gets really, really expensive. If you have the one database per customer model, you know where the perfect place to put that database is? Azure SQL DB. Azure SQL DB is freaking magical for that kind of design because you can keep it cheap as all hell. You can use elastic pools to manage resources as a group. Uh, it's just phenomenally effective. Then when you have one customer that needs to be like Cadillac tier, 
I wonder why I say Cadillac, because it really should be like Rolls Royce or Maybach tier. We have one customer that needs to be like Cadillac tier. You can change their resources differently than everybody else. You could put them on a hyperscale, whatever you want to do. Uh, but that's the way that I would roll for that particular data model or for that particular high availability disaster recovery thing. Now, usually when SaaS customers come to me and they say, we're having this problem with availability groups, it's too late to go change the data model. And often they don't want to go to Azure SQL to be. So what you should be doing in that case is use uh, failover clustered instances like we talked about in an earlier question. It's a great fit for failover clustered instances plus log shipping for disaster recovery. Um, you can try sand snapshots, but they tend to fall apart uh, over 20 or 35 databases per volume. So it's kind of messy. Next up, Miriam says, what's the best resource for writing how to how learning how to write efficient linked server queries? You don't write them. Connect to the server that has the data you need. You'll hear me say that a lot. Mandeep asks, what are the top things that you see that break log shipping? The top things that I see that break log shipping, number one by a long shot, is changing security on the file share where the log backups go. Happens all the time. All of a sudden, someone will go through and they'll make security changes, and all of a sudden, the SQL Server can't write its backups there, or the reporting SQL Server can't restore the backups from there. Number one by far is log shipping. Uh, number two, but not nearly as close, is when some bozo decides to change versions up on the reporting side uh, or on the disaster recovery side. They decide to go to a newer version of SQL Server. Now, that's fine. The SQL Server can restore those databases, but they can't be readable because in order to roll forward to a newer version of SQL Server, SQL Server has to make changes to the database, and unfortunately it can't do that, and then continue to restore old copies of the transaction log. So that, that it works fine for disaster recovery, it just doesn't work fine for things like reporting when you want to pull the data off of that lab, log ship secondary. Next up, Pradeep asks, given modern fast storage, is clustered column store index fragmentation as inconsequential as non-clustered uh, index fragmentation? Pradeep, that's a great question, and I go into massive details about it in my Fundamentals of Column Store class, where I explain why column store index fragmentation is totally different than row store indexes, and I explain why it's so important to do index maintenance on column store, and it's so hard, because if you just type alter index rebuild, you're effectively throwing all the data up in the air and watching it all come down in random places. So for that, check out my Fundamentals of Column Store class. Uh, next up, Ronaldo asks, for Cloud SQL VMs, what are the top chargeback methods that you see for each customer on the VM? Uh, that really hasn't changed since uh, on-premises VM days. We had exactly the same challenges. If you wanted to break it out per database or per user, it's extremely hard because there's nothing built into SQL Server that will aggregate costs per database, especially when you consider the problem with cross-database queries. The closest thing that I've seen to it is Resource Governor in Enterprise Edition. In Enterprise Edition, you can configure Resource Governor so that different users go into different pools, and then you can run reports based off of the Resource Governor DMVs that will show you how many CPU cycles, how many memory grants uh, that each of those resource pools have used, and then you can break it down from there. It's not perfect, but it's just the closest thing that I've seen to work well. Uh, Olga says, have you ever had to rebuild all indexes and what was the use case? Um, oh, yes, of course. Oh, to fix fill factor. Oh, yeah, I've taken over SQL servers where some bozo set SQL set fill factor to like 70%. Like, I want empty space on every page in order to reduce page splits. I'm like, you yo-yo, you just made your database like 30% larger. You made your scan times 30% longer. You made your backup times 30% longer. You made your storage costs 30% higher, all of those things. And then when we break that down and, and understand what 
terrible problem it's hap that's causing there. We just rebuild all the indexes with 100% fill factor and call it a day. Hey, G Surgeon from the Netherlands there. Renegade Larson, good to see you there as well. Um, I do have a funny story from when somebody set fill factor to 10 because they thought they were doing 90. They thought, oh, I want to leave 10% empty space on every page. So they set fill factor to 10. And immediately their database exploded as they rebuilt indexes to do that. And their fill fact or their uh, database size grew by 10x. And immediately everybody started calling me and freaking out. Well, our database has exploded for no reason. We had to go through that little experiment. Uh, next up, Jessica asks, hey, Brent, a meta question. When you were building PolGab, did you intentionally set out to build a site without trackers that would be blocked by uBlock origin? It's amazing to see a clean site for the first time in a while. Yes. We don't capture IP addresses. We don't have any kind of third party cookies. None of that. We wanted it to be as lean and GDPR compliant as possible. So it, that was absolutely on purpose. Uh, next question, Muppet asks, new one that just came in, uh, says, Hello, Brent. My friend has a uh, typically designed table with 1.2 billion rows stored as row store. It performs sluggishly, so I was thinking about partitioning. But what do you think about column store instead? Go to columnscore.com. That's column store, but with a C, like score, high score, low score. Column score, and then take the quiz on there, answering it for that table. That'll give you a score, like a high school or college grade score from A to F, about how likely it is that things are going to be faster and well received by your users. That's columnscore.com, and it's totally free. Uh, next up, Brinjar says, how do you determine the optimal column order when creating a non-clustered column store index? For column store, doesn't matter. For column store, every column is stored. Isn't that neat how it works in the name? Column store. God, they got smart with that name. Column store indexes. Every column is stored independently, so it doesn't matter which column order that you pick. Now, it does matter a lot which columns go in there. And I talk about that in my Fundamentals of Column Store class. But in terms of column order, it does not matter at all. Michael J. Swart in the house. Canada is here. Howdy, sir. Good to see you. Michael, I should say, too, I've, I didn't post that picture. I should have taken a picture of us on Inst for Instagram whenever we were having dinner. I totally forgot. Now, too, I touch my hair as I say this. I also realized I didn't put any hair product in today. So y'all are probably like, what on earth is going on with Brent's hair? I am trying to grow it out longer. Think James May of Top Gear. I'm trying to grow it out longer just to see what it would be like. I used to have all my hair was about uh, chin length. <laughs> Ray right, says, what on earth is going on with your hair? Um, I used to have chin length hair and even longer than that when I was in college. Um, and because of where I lived, <coughs> really high humidity. So it was a total mess to have to deal with. Um, and I wanted really straight hair, like I wanted it going absolutely, like, you know, like Japanese hair, like totally straight and lying down. Now I don't want that. I'm not Japanese, so I don't, my hair's not going to look like that. I understand how hair works. Um, so I was just going to try for something wild and kind of floppy like James May. We'll see how it goes. I'm getting a haircut today for the underneath, just to trim the underneath parts. Uh, but we'll see as that thing starts to grow. And then we'll do, we've been going for, oh yeah, half an hour now. We'll do one more. Um, so, uh, uh, all About Search says, when someone types a third character for the first name, middle name, or last name in the FE, I don't even know what FE is. When there's a space in the name, he says, Entity Framework Query starts scanning the whole table and times out. Any tips? I don't know what you're trying to do. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to... Oh, DBA Duck says front end. Uh, when someone types a third character for the first name in the front end, it queries the database's computed column. 
I think I'd want to see the query. It sounds like you're trying to concatenate first name, middle name, and last name. And I, I think you're trying to use some kind of percent sign in the middle, like you might be searching for a space in the query. And it sounds like that's a badly designed query. If you want, shoot me the output or shoot me the query that you're building, and then I'll take a look at it. But if you're trying to search for a space by itself, you're screwed. Uh, so we'll do one more. Uh, let's see here. We'll scan through the list and find an interesting one. Do, do, do. Oh, Montero. Oh, this is actually good. Montero says, hi, Brent. I hope you're doing good. <laughs> I'm not. Things are terrible. I just, I'm kidding. It's hilarious. I think of myself as like the most laid back person that I know, most chill laid back person that I know, which is kind of funny because I just had to take a, an allergy pill, Singulair. Um, I'm trying to find different ways to control my allergies, and my doctor recommended Singulair to try. And I was looking at the side effects, and it was like rampantly known for suicidal thoughts and depression. Hmm. So I said, I warned Eve, I said, I think I can, I think I'm going to know if this pops up. But you tell me, I said to Eve, just so you know, I'm starting this pill. One of the possible side effects is, is uh, depression and suicidal thoughts. I said, be on the lookout for that. If you see it, just tell me so that I know I can drop this pill. And that's the end of that. Um, but I, I was like, I'm also telling you because I know that I am extremely aware of that stuff because I'm super chill and laid back. Uh, but uh, you know what I noticed? Within the first two days of, of uh, taking it, my jaw would be locked. Like, uh, I noticed because the muscles in my jaw hurt and like my teeth would hurt. I'd catch myself clenching my teeth. I'm like, what in the hell is that? That's not normal for me. It is overnight. You know, like I grind my teeth when I sleep. Um, but it, like to have it happen during the day, I was like, wow, that's there's some real side effects there. I still think uh, I'm still super chill and laid back and all that. But it was just funny to see that side effect hit so quickly. Uh, Montro continues, have there been moments in your long career that you might have taken another path? Yes, many. Um, if your answer is yes, where might you have ended up in life? There were so many times. I interviewed with Microsoft and I would have gone to work as a premier field engineer on site at a giant retail company that you have heard of and shopped at. Um, I uh, would have been a deep database administrator for Southern Wine and Spirits for the rest of my life and very happy with it uh, had they not had a no telecommuting policy. The only reason I left there was uh, uh, Erica and I had to move to another city for her air traffic control career. So I was like, there's, you know, sorry, I just have to find a job in another city. Um, uh, Quest Software at one point decided to start offering SQL Server training, uh, at which point they were going to make me sign an agreement saying that everything that I did for training was going to belong to them. And at that point, I built up so many PowerPoint presentations that were my own and that we'd agreed were my own. I built up so many that I'm like, oh, I would be an idiot to to take that gig and lose all this training that I built, I'm better off going out and starting my own company uh, or working with someone else. Um, I Right after I left Quest, I uh, started or went in with Paul and Kim, Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp, wonderful people. I adore their nice professionally and personally. Um, and so we started a consulting company. Just things didn't work quite right or else I would be part of SQL skills to this day. There have been so many little things where Oop, just because of one hitch, I've gone off and gone a different direction. Um, do I have any regrets? Nope, not at all, because I'm very happy with where I am. And I always think that if you have regrets and you want to rewind your life back to a different point and make different choices, it would be so easy for things to get worse. Like, just the slightest screw up over on some other parallel existence and you know you're in the gutter somewhere having a terrible life so i'm extremely blessed super fortunate 
Um, in terms of the next one, like the next uh, weirdo flip. So I, I moved to Mexico and I was on the path to retiring. I bought a house in, or bought a, a condo in Cabo, Mexico, um, on the overlooking the beach. Um, and uh, uh, thought I was going to retire there and was coasting to a stop in terms of building training and all that. And I think I was down there for six months before I went. I am bored out of my gourd. Um, I miss uh, shopping in the U.S. I miss cars. I miss road trips in the U.S. None of those things that you could do down there. Like you couldn't have nice cars, sports cars, whatever. The roads are trash. Uh, you don't want to show wealth down there. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to pick back up and I could have totally retired down there on the beach, and I'm sure I would have been some degree of happy for the rest of my life. Um, but just ended up coming back here, and now I'm uh, working again. So it's kind of funny how that works out. All right, so we will stop there. I've been going for quite a while now. I will. Now it's funny, I have um, a whole bunch of work to do on the first responder kit. I was debating whether or not I was going to live stream that. This shirt doesn't work with my green screen background. The color of this shirt is too close to green that I end up getting <laughs> ghost Brent Ozar. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Now, normally I would like show you uh, SQL Server Management Studios. I'm going through here and working on GitHub issues or whatever. Um, but because of this shirt, uh, I can't quite do that. And so it comes down to whether comes down to whether or not I want to go change my shirt and then start another stream uh, later on today <coughs> or not. Genesis, thanks from Denmark and love the t-shirt. I got, oh, this is Iceland. This t-shirt's from Iceland. Um, I was going to say I got it on my last trip through Norway and... Where'd I go? Norway and Sweden? Norway and Sweden. But I forgot this one's from Iceland. I made a stop over there as well. Nah, but that part of the world. I adore that part of the world. The whole uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all of that is just an absolutely glorious place. I don't know that I'll be there very often uh, because when I go to that part of the world, I tend to go to Iceland, but it's just a glorious part of the world. Surly Dev says, you said Eve is away. You also said bachelor pad. We know that you all have clean laundry. No, I do the laundry. I do the laundry here. It's very funny how household uh, duties shake out. You know, the older that you get, the more you start to recognize, all right, what is it that I'm good at? What is it that doesn't bother me? What does bother me? Um, I find laundry really therapeutic, just like I find uh, yard work therapeutic. Like, I don't mind going out there and piddling around in the yard. And um, same thing with cleaning up the kitchen, like after cooking. Eve does all the cooking. Um, all I do is clean things and organize. And Eve is, like, endlessly thankful. Excuse me that I don't mind cleaning the kitchen uh, because she'll go in there and make an absolute mess cleaning with all kinds of Chinese stuff. Uh, and then the kitchen will look like a disaster zone. I'm down there, dee, 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 you know, like listening to music or watching uh, uh, Dead by Daylight streamers. Um, and she's like, I can't believe you enjoy doing that. So it's always kind of funny. Uh, Surly Dev says, I bundle my socks when I put them in the washing machine. What? When you put them in? I never thought about that. That's interesting. My my trick with it is <coughs> I only use two colors of socks. I have white socks that are all the same brand and black socks that are all the same brand. And that's it. Some of that's because I'm colorblind, you know, it just kind of makes it easier. Uh, but I just literally, th I, I, whenever I get down to a relatively low number, yeah, exactly, Surly Dev says that's the other alternative, a dozen pairs of each, that's exactly what I do. And when they get old, or when, you know, like some of them are torn up, I'm just like, out they go, buy another dozen from Amazon of whatever looks the comfiest uh, at that point. Now, g Surgeon says is matching socks still a thing in 2023. I, I think if you had dress socks, then mismatching, especially patterns, mismatching them is really cool. Um, Eve will do that all the time. She'll take a black and a white pair and a white and a black pair that have opposite patterns and, and wear them. Um, for people with my level of fashion sense, that, no, I matching uh, socks all the way. Oh, my neighbor. Is that my neighbor just pulled in? No, it's somebody else. 
All right, so I will stop here. Depending on how things go, I might do another stream later as I work through the first responder kit. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend, y'all, and I will see y'all in the next office hours. Adios.